Hey everybody and welcome to episode 13 of Creator for the Creator. Today I'm titling this episode Evidence for the Exodus and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you guys a little bit about the archaeological evidence that we have for the biblical account of the Exodus. Many secular historians and archaeologists do not believe that there is actual evidence and proof that the Exodus happened, and even some biblical scholars define the Exodus as not a literal thing that actually happened, but in the Old Testament, God did these incredible works and wonders and miracles in front of the entire um, people of Israel so that we could pass down these things to our children and our children's children and their children and their children's children because this is a time whenever God did something that he has never done before and that he shall never do again in this same exact way. And so for that reason, this is something that we should, you know, bring to attention again and remind our children again of what God did all those 3,500 years ago and how he brought us out from the land of Egypt and delivered us from the hands of our oppressors. So to begin with, I'd like to read from Exodus 15. I'm going to be reading part of the song of Moses that the Israelites sang as soon as they were brought out of the land of Egypt. I'm not going to be reading the entire chapter because it's 27 verses long, but I encourage you to go and read it for yourself. It is a beautiful song. I'm not going to be singing it because I'm not a singer, but I will be reading part of it. So this is what it says. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider, or its chariot, he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host has he cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also sunk in the Red Sea. The floods cover them. They sank in the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow those rising against you. You send forth your fury. It consumes them like stubble. With the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood fixed in a heap, and the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You, Lord, blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glory, glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth's sea swallowed them. You and your mercy and loving kindness have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. So I wanted to read that because it's just like this incredibly joyous moment that right after God had delivered the Israelites out of the hand of Pharaoh, you know, he, Pharaoh and his army of 600 chariots, it says, chased the Israelites through the wilderness into this big beach, you know, opening up right there at the Red Sea, right where they would cross and God would divide the waters of the Red Sea and they would cross on dry land into um, the land of Midian. But I wanted to read that because it's just this incredibly joyous moment, you know, just before um, at the end of that big occurrence that after 430 years of being enslaved to the Egyptians and then being brought into 
this time where they would live in the wilderness and um, receive the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law and um, all of those things would happen. It's just in between those things. So I wanted to read that bit. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about Mount Sinai and about the evidence of the Exodus, like I said. So there are two, at least two proposed um, areas for Mount Sinai. One of them is in Egypt and the other one is in Saudi Arabia. The one in Egypt is located on the peninsula of Sinai or the Sinai Peninsula. And this is the traditional location of Mount Sinai. It is um, called today St. Catherine's and they actually have a monastery there that the Catholic Church has put up there and it's actually that location that is in Egypt um, is actually a newer tradition and it's only existed since the 4th century AD but the other location is located in the land of Midian which um, in my belief is closer to the telling of what the Bible actually says so Moses, who brought the Israelites, or was the person that God used to bring the Israelites out of the land of Egypt, um, his story is told at the very beginning of the Exodus. And so, really, the story of the Exodus begins with Joseph, because at the very end of Genesis, or in the middle of Genesis, maybe we should just start from the beginning. Um, in the beginning, God chose Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, and so which were a pagan people in the land of Mesopotamia. And Abraham was the son of Terah, who had no, you know, affiliation with God, our God. Um, but God called out Abraham from this pagan uh, country, and he makes a promise to him. And we can read about that promise in Genesis 15 is one place where you can read about it. And in that promise, God gives a promise to a prophecy to Abraham about how his descendants would be enslaved to a nation that is greater than them. But after 430 years to the day that God would deliver them out of um, their oppressor's hands. So I'm going to read that prophecy really quickly from Genesis 15. And this is verses 13 through 15. It says, And God said to Abram, Know positively that your descendants will be strangers dwelling as temporary residents in a land that is not theirs. And they will be slaves there and will be afflicted and oppressed for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on that nation whom they serve. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. And you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. And in the fourth generation they shall come back to Canaan again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full and complete. So, like I said, it began with Abraham. Abraham had Isaac. Abraham and Sarah had Isaac at a very ripe old age, and that was also another promise of God. And Isaac was the father of Jacob and Esau. Esau sold off his birthright as the firstborn to Jacob. Jacob would be later renamed as Israel. And Israel would go on and have the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 sons of Jacob. And so from those 12 tribes comes this entire nation of Israel. So it, Israel is both a person, but also it's a nation. So a whole nation came from this person, Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. And from Israel came Joseph, which is, like I said, where the story of the Exodus begins. Because um, the, brothers and si the brothers of Joseph, the 12 tribes, or the other 11, 11 tribes, sold off Joseph into slavery because he was the favored son of Jacob. 
And so whenever they sold him off, he was sold and ended up in the desert of Egypt where he would eventually rise um, and be promoted more or less to like, I think it's second second in command to Pharaoh. And there is evidence of Joseph's time and his, um, how he was honored in, in Egypt. And you can see this through what they call the Joseph stone that gives a testimony to how he was, um, how he helped them through the seven year famine, which is a story that is explained in Genesis as well. So after all of Joseph's brothers come back into the land of Egypt during the time of a famine, they come into Egypt bringing their little brother Benjamin, who Joseph had not yet met. And they basically repented, said they were sorry. After all this big story, you can go and read it in Genesis. And Joseph ends up forgiving them and revealing himself to them. And um, he gets to meet his brother Benjamin. And then all of those brothers and their kids and um, Jacob come back into Egypt. And so they enter as 70 people, it talks about in Genesis into Egypt and then when they would leave 430 years later they would leave as a nation and that's also a part of the prophecy and promise of God to Abraham and so they begin as a small group of people but after all these generations and being enslaved to the Egyptians when God does bring them out by the hand of Moses um, they come out as an entire nation So like I said, the second location of what I believe is the true Mount Sinai is located in Saudi Arabia in the land of Midian. This area has been, you know, put down by other scholars, biblical and secular scholars, archaeologists, historians, because, well, for a few different reasons, but First off, it's tradition. It's the long-standing tradition, even though it's a newer tradition, of St. Catherine's Mountain, which is, like I said, still in Egypt, which doesn't even make sense with the biblical story because God brought them out of Egypt, and the Sinai Peninsula is still considered part of Egypt. However, like I said, a lot of people can't, you know, they won't really let go of Um, St. Catherine's as Mount Sinai because of that long-standing tradition from the fourth century but like I said there's an older tradition that um, and locals will actually testify in Saudi Arabia about how Jabal al-Laws which is the mountain of almonds is what that means in Midian is actually Mount Sinai. So you can go and do your own research on this. I highly suggest that you do. It's really exciting, but it is my belief that this mountain in the land of Midian is actually the true Mount Sinai because there's more evidence for us for it to be there. And I'm going to be sharing some of that evidence with you guys today. So I, you know, I could talk about how I believe that Joseph was, or the biblical Joseph was the secular Imhotep from the third dynasty of Egyptian kings alongside um, Pharaoh de Djoser. Or I could talk about how I believe that Moses was pulled out of the Nile by the most famous Egyptian queen, which is Hepshetsut. You know, or I could talk also about the Hyksos and about how I believe, you know, those are the people who were the Israelites because a lot of secular historians especially talk about how there's no evidence that the Israelites were ever even in Egypt to even prove that there could even potentially be a story of the Exodus. I have come to understand through my own research that the Hyksos were probably those people. But I don't want to focus on any of those things. This topic gets me really excited. But today I want to focus on eight major archaeological findings at Jabal Alaz or the Mountain of Almonds, also known as Jabal Al-Musa or Jabal Musa, which is 
the mountain of Moses, as the locals like to call it. So the first finding I'm going to be covering is the Nueva Land Bridge, located at Nueva Beach. So this, I believe, is the site of the crossing of the Israelites from Egypt into the land of Midian, with Mount Sinai being on the other side. And this is the only location where, first off, there's a beach even big enough to fit the one to two million, approximately two million people, you know, crossing over, Israelites crossing over. Um, It's a five mile wide beach. It's the only um, beach in that entire area at the Red Sea that's even large enough to fit all those people. And if you go and look in the map, you can see where they would have been chased, you know, by Pharaoh and his 600 chariots um, in between all those mountain ranges, you know, leading up to the beach and where the water opens up and how, you know, at that point, that's whenever all the Israelites were like, why did you bring us out here just to die right here? We would have rather served the Egyptians, but um, it's just really crazy, you know, that they were uh, surrounded on every side and they were basically, Moses led them in what seemed to be like this forced area but then it opens up into this big beach. And so there's also a really compelling evidence that shows that there's a land bridge underwater. So let me just read this from Exodus 14. This is verses 19 through 22. It says, And the angel of God who went before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. It was a cloud and darkness to the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to the Israelites. And the one host did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the Israelites went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So basically it says right there in the scriptures that God brought about an east wind that blew the waters and it became like a big wall of water on their left hand and on their right hand. And they were allowed to pass through on dry land. And it's actually been discovered, like I said, that there is a land bridge where they could have easily passed if the waters had just parted there. It wasn't just like this super really deep area, but it was actually this perfect bridge underwater that they could have passed upon. There's also been discovered two pillars on either side that were erected by Solomon and These were discovered, I believe, in the 20th century um, by someone who is not an archaeologist, someone who's not even a preacher or anything like that, or a historian, really. I think it was just someone who's made a couple of different um, findings, biblical findings, and people don't credit this person with having any kind of know-how because he doesn't have a degree in anything, so a lot of people have put down his findings. However, you know, we can see throughout the Bible how God uses people who don't really seem like they have a place to be doing what they're doing, but he uses, you know, kind of like underdogs and um, it doesn't really matter, you know, what your attributes are. If God calls you, you know, he qualifies you. And so for that reason, um, I think you just have to look at the evidence. It doesn't matter what that person who discovered it, what they've done their whole life. It just matters. Look at the evidence, you know? So that's what I looked at for myself and um, compared it to the words that are found in the Bible because the Bible kind of reads itself like a map going from this place to that place. And they went there and, you know, it has a lot of detail in it. So you can really look at the evidence next to the biblical account and see if it adds up or not. 
along with prayer, of course, that also really helps a lot. <laughs> so, like I said, Solomon erected a pillar on both the Egyptian side where the Israelites crossed as well as on the Saudi Arabia side. Now, on the Egyptian side, the man who discovered the pillars, whenever he discovered them, the one on the Egyptian side, he found um, at the opening of the Red Sea and it was like in the water and all of the inscriptions kind of had mostly worn away. Um, it's now been re-erected in the spot where it was originally erected. And the one on the Saudi Arabia side has actually been confiscated. However, there's still a place marking where it once stood. The second major archaeological finding that marks Jabal al laws as most likely the location of the real Mount Sinai is that there were chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea at the crossing at the Nueva Beach. So there are some documentaries on YouTube and um, you can see photographs on the internet. It's not really that hard to find at all that show coral that has been wrapped around um, human artifacts that have been like scattered throughout the Nueva Beach and underwater there. It's actually a public diving site. So um, people have gone, you know, and done tests on these things and found that, um, you know, coral doesn't just attach onto sand or just anything. It attaches onto actual objects and things. And so the shape, you know, is not the same as what it was, but you can still see kind of the remnant of what it did cover. And it literally looks like axles and chariot, four spoke um, chariot wheels sticking up out of the sand covered in coral. It's really crazy. And archeo some archeolo archaeologists have said that it looks like a scattered like junkyard you know, or a grave site even, and they have actually found um, the bones of a man, or bones of men, and bones of horses as well, scattered among the ruins um, of all of this. So it's believed that this perhaps could be the 600 chariots and all the men, including the Pharaoh, who were chasing the Israelites. So I'm going to read from Exodus 14, and this is verses 23 through 31. It says, The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord, through the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down on the host of the Egyptians and discomfited them and bound their chariot wheels, making them drive heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, and the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength, a normal flow when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled into it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians and shook them off into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that pursued them. Not even one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that the great work which the Lord did against the Egyptians and the people reverently feel, feared the Lord and trusted in the Lord and to his servant Moses. The third major finding is the twelve springs at Elam with the seventy palms. So in Exodus 15, the very last verse, verse 27 says, And they came to Elam, where, they were, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Still to this day, there is a beautiful site that the locals refer to as Elam. 
it still has many, many palms and 12 springs or 12 wells of water still there to this day. The fourth finding, and perhaps one of my very favorites, is the split rock at Horeb or at Rephidim. And this rock is the rock that Moses split because all of the Israelites were complaining of being thirsty. In Exodus chapter 17, it says, All the congregation of the Israelites moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and encamped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you find fault with me? Why do you tempt the Lord and try his patience? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And and the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the rod which you smote the river Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Mount Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. This is an especially incredible finding this rock was discovered by a couple who was doing some research in Saudi Arabia at the time looking for something such as this and it's unmissable like when you see it it is like you'll never forget this rock it's so beautiful it's said to stand 60 feet up into the air and it's also said that there all the rocks underneath it have been smoothed by the water that supposedly gushed from that split. You can tell where there has been water erosion and they say that perhaps there's like a geyser or some crazy thing that opened up, you know, supernaturally, of course, by the rod that was smoked by Moses. And there's actually some scriptures in Psalm 78, which is one of the most beautiful psalms. If you've never read it, you should definitely go and read it. I'm going to read just two verses from it now that talk about this very um, split rock at Horeb. And it says, He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as out of the deep. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. So that is really, really amazing. You know, if there were up to 2 million people that were thirsty during this time, like you would think it wouldn't just be a small stream. It would need to turn into something like rivers so that all these people would be able to drink freely, you know, and crowd. It wouldn't be like this big crowd around one area, but that they would all be able to drink freely. And so if you go and look at the images from this specific rock it's really incredible and you can tell where there would have been a pooling kind of area and a lake kind of at the bottom for everyone to come around and drink so the fifth major archaeological finding at Jabal al Laws, or what I believe is the real Mount Sinai is that there are still bounds set around the mountain by Moses as explained in Exodus 19 as well as the fact that it's literally burnt on the top. It's a mountain that literally has an entire, its peak is burnt and like blackened from being lit on fire. So I'm going to read from Exodus 19 verses 9 through 18. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you and remain steadfast forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, Go and sanctify the people today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready by the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set bounds for the people round about, saying, Take heed that you go not up into the mountain or touch the border of it. 
Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified them, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready by the by the day after tomorrow. Do not go near a woman. The third morning there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people from the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke for the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like that of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. So you would expect a mountain that was that God descended upon in fire to be burnt. And to this day, Jabal Allah's or the mountain of almonds in the land of Midian is burnt. And it's not what some archaeologists say is volcanic rock. It's not a volcano. It is a mountain. And whenever you break open the rocks, it's not black on the inside. It's just black on the outside. It's just been charred. So that goes along with the biblical account that God came and descended upon the mountain in what was fire. And um, we know in other scriptures that describe God as a consuming fire. So that makes sense to me. And there are actually still bounds that, like it says here in verse 12, that Moses was commanded to set bounds all around the mountain so that the people would not touch it or go near it. Um, Those bounds that he set are still there to this day. Some of them are. The sixth finding that is really incredible and leads to another reason to believe that Jabal Allah's is the true Mount Sinai is the fact that there is an altar of Moses at the foot of the mountain right where the biblical account says it will be. So in Exodus 24 verse 4 it says, Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. He rose up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 pillars representing Israel's 12 tribes. To this day, there is an altar set, like I said, at the very foot of the mountain. It has what scholars believe is a um, burnt sacrifice area where they have recovered the remains of animals and Um, animal waste there and there's also the pillars that were set up by Moses still there now they are scattered a little bit but there are locals who say that some years back it was the site was a little bit cleaner and you could see the pillars and the um, foundation that those pillars were laid upon more clearly so even though the site has been kept pretty protected and out of sight by the Saudi Arabia regime and government. Um, There, you know, are still people that have been able to get through for different reasons and special permissions and, um, but they have protected the site um, very, very well. And I'm kind of thankful for that now because we're able to see, you know, Um, what it really was and I believe it has been preserved you know to some degree and that's really exciting the seventh finding at Jabal Allah's that relates to evidence for the exodus is the fact that there is an altar for the golden calf there okay it's really crazy looking it's first off it's huge it's like this raised altar I mean of course there's no golden calf there anymore because of course like it says in Exodus that Moses came down, he squashed that thing and turned it into dust and dumped it in the water and made all the Israelites drink it, which is kind of crazy. But so, yeah, the golden calf is not there anymore, but there is still a place where it was. And so in Exodus chapter 32, it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, they gathered together to Aaron and said to him, up. Up. 
make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron replied, Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives, your sons and daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it to a molten calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw the molten calf, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast day to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So this altar is actually, um, the Saudi Arabians know that it's a very special site because they have fenced it in and, you know, have put off a lot of um, posts like this, do not enter, you know, in multiple languages there. And it's just really crazy because there's still petroglyphs of cows on these big altar stones where once perhaps the golden calf um, idol rested. And um, that makes sense along with the biblical account, biblical account because it says, these are your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. That was the proclamation that they made. And so, you know, you there's reason to believe there was more than one idol. It was multiple gods, but it was, you know, mainly this cow god. And so maybe that'll give you some insight next time someone says, holy cow, that's probably what they're talking about. <laughs> but really, I didn't realize that until... Um, I don't know, just recently, I was like, oh, that is probably what that means, but, um, anyways, so, yeah, that's really, really crazy, you know, that there's still, um, evidence for that, um, this huge site, and this huge altar where perhaps once the golden calf stood, and then the eighth and final major archaeological finding at the site of Jabal Alal's is the cave of Elijah. So this can't necessarily be proven that this was in fact the cave of Elijah. However, the only other person that was allowed to visit Mount Sinai after Moses and after the um, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness of the Israelites was the prophet Elijah. And it tells this story in 1 Kings chapter 19. In verses 8 through 9, and this is right after Elijah, you know, had called down fire from heaven and had tested um, Baal, the god Baal, next to the god of Israel and all the people. And he, like, makes this big charge. If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal's God, then follow him. And, you know, there's this, you can go and read about it. But anyways... This is right after all of that happened in in First Kings chapter nineteen. It says, "So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah?'" And then there's also another verse, verse 13, that says, When Elijah heard the voice, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So, like I said, even though we can't prove that this was the specific cave of Elijah, it matches kind of the description of it being at Mount Horeb. And it's just kind of big enough for someone to stay in and um, it's just really incredible to me that that could potentially be the cave of Elijah. So I encourage everyone to go and do your own research on this topic. This is something that like really helped encourage my faith a lot. You know, I think that it's like widely believed that you kind of just have to, you know, have like this maybe blind faith about 
you know, the story of the Exodus and everything, but there is, if all this happened and all this happened to, you know, 1 million to 2 million people, you know, 30, even 3,500 years ago, like there's, you best believe there's going to be evidence somewhere for it. Like they tracked and traversed all this land and, you know, crossed on dry land through a sea. All these people died chasing them. And, you know, I just, there's so much evidence around this specific mountain in Saudi Arabia and it matches all of the descriptions, all the things and evidences surrounding it is just really incredible to me. And I feel that um, this mountain has a lot more biblical evidence than um, St. Catherine's does, which is, like I said, still located in Egypt anyways. God brought them out of Egypt. So it doesn't really make sense to me, even just based off that. But once you add in all the evidence, you know, that is sitting right there and has been protected and preserved all this time by the Saudi Arabians like that is really crazy and the fact that all the locals get really excited whenever like someone does finally get to gain some any kind of access there and they're like so excited to tell people like this is where Moses was this is where the Israelites were here's where Elam is like that to me is really exciting and should definitely be looked into and no matter you know, who discovered these things, that shouldn't matter at all. But actually, in fact, whenever it's discovered by someone who's an absolute nobody, God tends to use people like that. And Moses actually was somebody who he knew he wasn't qualified. He straight up said, I can't do it. I can't talk to all these people. And, you know, God still made a way. God still used him and chose him. So for that reason, I think that we should definitely, you know, look harder into these things and you don't have to go by a blind faith. You can't. There is actual evidence for the things that happened in the Bible because it's real, true history. It is the Exodus is a literal event that really did happen. And you can really look back and see the things that are left behind from these occurrences. If anybody has any questions or any comments or anything to add to this, drop it below or send me a message and we can get connected about these things. This is something, a topic that has always interested me so much because this is something incredible that God did for the Israelites and that something that we can look back and see how strong and mighty and powerful and the sovereignty of God and this is something we should recall to our children and remind them and tell them about what God did. So thank you all so much for watching today. I hope you learned something today. I hope that this excites you to go out and do your own research and look at all the things that are out there, you know, like this is a time where you're just one click away from seeing something that could truly change your life and you know, just pray about all of these things. And um, yeah, God bless you so much. Y'all have a good rest of your weekend.